Hi and welcome to this Graham Farish unboxing video. I noticed that lots of people are listening um, and watching unboxing videos on YouTube and I wondered if this would be popular because these are my brand new Graham Farish N-Gage Locos and I've bought two N-Class locomotives and N-Class were used across the Southern Railway they were introduced between about 1917 and the mid 1930s and were designed by Richard Maunsell. And one of the things that's quite interesting about these is that they had elements of the Great Western uh, 4300 class, but also uh, practices from the Midland, London Midland region were brought in as well. So what we have is a loco that actually looks a little bit like it could be at home on either the Midland um, or the Great Western as well as the Southern region uh, and these were a mogul design so that's two pony wheels at the front six driven wheels and then in this case obviously a tender on the back as well so these were used for mixed traffic if I remember rightly they were class four for passenger and five for freight but they were used on various services certainly on the southeast region and even as far west as Reading um, and in some sometimes uh, down in the southwest as well Exeter and Exmouth kind of direction so I've bought two of these N-class locos uh, they look the same but they are in fact slightly different so the left hand one is the late crest so the late crest is basically uh, mid 50s to the mid 60s that was really kind of the end of steam and that's number 372932 that's the Farish part number and the loco number, as you can see on the side there, is 31811. So that's the late crest version. The early crest version, slightly different number, 31844. And the early emblem, uh, emblem was the, the start of British Rail just after the war, about 1948, until about the mid-50s. Although, probably like me, um, I'm not too religious about eras, and I model the steam era... I'm not really too fussed if I have early and late emblem locos on the same layout just because there aren't really that many options if you want to have lots of late crest locos that are the same you're going to have to buy lots of the same model and then you'd have to renumber them or just accept that you've got you know three or four locos with the same number on your layout the other thing that was on the end here that you might have noticed that 6 DCC like a lot of tender locomotives in um, more recently built N-scale locomotives, they have a slot for a DCC decoder, which is something that I am going to do eventually, but I need to run these in on DC before I put the decoders in them. So let's just leave one out the way because they're obviously both going to be the same. Uh, typical Farish kind of box, we slide this out. And that's just a card sleeve. There's nothing too interesting on there. So I'll just leave that at the back. And then we have one of these standard kind of Farish boxes. And again, put the lid over here. So in here, their um, they're basic the idea here is that they have this kind of plastic cover um, over the top of the loco. Um, and that's basically placed inside the bottom um, of the solid plastic box the lid that I just took off so if I take that out a second so this here is just a plastic box uh, useful for storing your locomotives in for sure um, probably most of you keep them like I do and keep the locomotives in there we have a loco and we have this kind of bubble packaging this vacuum form packaging that just holds the locomotive in place so again we'll remove that and like a lot of these locos nowadays, it's, it has this useful piece of plastic. And the reason that's useful is it helps to be able to get the locomotive out of the packet. Otherwise, you're poking fingers down. And you can see if we just pop that up on there a second. So let's just slide that box to the side for a second. So if we actually look at this, let's zoom in a little bit. Um, You'll see there's some very uh, delicate pieces of plastic here. 
um, that just kind of helps you to take the, the coal out um, to find the motor underneath there. But as you can see, one of the problems with the higher quality that we have um, on these modern locos is that you've got lots more fiddly bits to um, to get broken. And sorry, I'm just going to work out to twist this. So we've got lots of fiddly bits. One of the things that's different than some locos that you can buy nowadays is you'll notice that the locomotive has one of these horrible Rapido connectors on the front. Uh, so some locomotives come without that fitted. Uh, clearly it depends what you're going to do. That doesn't look very nice. But if you're going to be coupling up um, from, the, from the rear, so if you were, say, double-heading a train or you had a, you know, a pilot needed to couple onto the front of this, then you're going to need some kind of coupling. Otherwise, one of the things that comes in the box, at least I think that's what it is, if I get this bag out, is these are all the fiddly bits that you might or might not want to put on your model. So I don't know if you can, uh, where's the camera? Can you see how, how small these things are? So there's my finger, and they're the kind of old style British rail shackle couplings. So they were prototypically very accurate, but as you probably realize, they're very fiddly to use on an actual model railway. Whereas the, um, the couplings like the Rapido ones that you get on there are obviously much easier to use. Uh, there are also various other parts in here. I think there are um, fire irons are in here. You've got some what look like smoke deflectors. So various parts that I'm sure are going to be referred to in the instructions. And like I say, those things are tiny. So I'm going to certainly leave those in the bag for now. Um, there's, in some ways, there's no point rushing into detailing these models until you've made sure they're running and they're working and you're ready to use them on your um, on your model on your layout so as you can see here some very accurate valve gear um, I think that's Stevenson valve gear but I can't remember um, but you can see this very very accurately modeled for such a small uh, locomotive I mean even here you can see the writing on the side of this oh focus breaks a bit So you can actually see that the 4P5F is um, legible. Unfortunately, my autofocus won't pick it up very easily. But you can actually read that. Um, you can obviously read the number. That's quite straightforward. In terms of cab detail, um, let me see if I can get this camera down a little bit. If I just take it off the tripod. So, let's zoom out a second, try and get this to autofocus. You can see the kind of detail in the cab there, it's really quite fantastic. Picked out the controls in kind of gold and brass as they would be in a real locomotive, although they'd probably be a lot dirtier on, on a real one, but they've really captured the essence of these, you know, these wonderful and very common locomotives here. You've got brake gear on the tender, the massive um, flatbed springs there. Again a horrible ugly Rapido connector on the back. Um, the vacuum hose, the water filler um, and although it looks like the coal is blue it isn't actually blue it's just the way it's uh, rendering in this light. So we can see we've got um, a lot of stuff going on here. Now what happens in a lot of these newer um, newer locomotives is if I just um, tip that on its side, if we look under here, you'll notice that there are wires that go between the tender and the main body. And the reason is most of these um, newer trains, although I'm going to find out very soon, Um, have a either a motor in the tender and they're tender driven so the the Pico 2251 class and I think the Q1 as well um, which is a DAPOL unit they have the the motor in the back here 
and in some cases they have a little drive shaft that goes into the wheels here but either way you'll notice that there are pickups on all the wheels or certainly on almost all of the wheels and that's what the two wires are for it's to be able to pick up current from the tender in this case um, and send it over to the locomotive where in this case the motor is housed in the locomotive one of the reasons why they put the motor in the tender is by removing the motor out of the main body then what you're aiming to get is that kind of prototype space between um, the boiler and the running plate there so they've kind of got that here so I'm not sure how they've hidden the motor whether they've hidden it inside the cab or, or what have you um, but that's kind of what you're aiming to get and that's why um, and particularly on the, the standard British Rail standard classes that gap was actually quite noticeable so by putting the uh, motor in the tender in some cases you get away from that in this case if we tip it back on its side again we can see that these are just free spinning wheels on the tender although they have current collection and like I say it's sent over here to the locomotive so that's all great now I'm going to put some DCC decoders on these or in these um, at some point but let's just have a quick look if I put this back in the tripod let's just have a quick look at what the instructions uh, are going to tell us to do now one of the things that I know it says in the instructions if I just slide this out of the way there's a, yeah, the, the weight um, has just fallen out of the tender so I should probably put it up the right way put the weight in there So we have all the usual stuff, we've probably got the guarantee no doubt that everybody throws in the bin or whatever. So there's the product warranty, I'm obviously mostly not interested in that, I'll worry about that um, if it breaks. There's also a chance to join uh, a collector's club, so in this uh, in this club that Barkman run, I believe they run it for, um, for Farish and for their 00 stuff in Barkman mainline as well. And you get a magazine, a wagon, a calendar, um, and a catalogue as well. So quite cool if you're interested in that. Uh, warranty service, so again, if it breaks, you can obviously fill in that and um, get that fixed under warranty. And here's probably the most important thing to begin with, is under product maintenance and care, this is one of the reasons why we need to read the instructions even though if you're like me we don't like doing that is it says here that the locomotive is engineered and will require a short period of running time before operating at its best run for about half an hour at a moderate speed in each direction to allow the gears and the mechanism to bed in for smooth operation now this is um this is partly to um, bed in the gears but really one of the other things is to make sure that the brushes in the motor are also uh, worn in properly so that they're getting good contact with the motor otherwise if you start running it especially if you plug in a dcc decoder then you're going to start potentially seeing all kinds of things going wrong just because the current isn't really flowing properly so even though i don't have a dcc decoder fitted so this is a, a DCC model, uh, sorry, a DC model by default. Then I'm going to run that in with my um, old Gauge Master 12 volt DC, and it recommends that you do that before. Um, it says here actually at the bottom here. Um, let's see if you can see that. If intending to fit a DCC decoder, ensure that all features operate correctly as a DC model before fitting. The motors may be damaged by running with a DCC controller and less fitted with a decoder um, and don't, not, don't run them um, as an analog loco on a DCC system. Uh, what happens on DCC is uh, normally you, the voltage to the track is fixed at say 15 volts and the signal to the decoder is, is encoded on top of that DC supply but because uh, it doesn't matter to the DCC decoder what the voltage is then what some controllers do is they can vary the DC part of the DCC signal in order to run DC uh, a single DC locomotive without needing a decoder. Uh, the problem is the DC that that loco will see is really quite dirty because it's got all of the digital signals on the top which is why 
some people recommend you don't do that so they're saying here not to run uh, DC models on that kind of DCC system pretending to be um, direct current only and it also says not to run it with electronic track cleaners uh, thing about curves here second radius or better we'll find out soon enough it says here as well after every 24 hours of operation uh, your locomotive requires light lubrication to keep it in top condition use a plastic compatible lubricant suitable for models carefully applied to the gear train and motor bearings so that's fine um, and then it's got a whole load of stuff about cleaning and maintenance uh, please take care don't pull the buffers or the valve gear you know run your model on a firm surface not on the carpet um, blah 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 so that's the product maintenance and care and that's everything on that piece of paper and then the other piece of paper um, it's got some of the same information this is almost a quick quick start guide and then inside is various instructions about um, fitting the DCC decoder about fitting the accessory parts so like the um the steps and uh oh it's the valve um valve drain offs which are some of the parts that you get with it um and then also a list of the uh, replacement parts on the right hand side as well so that's kind of all fine so despite the fact it says not to run it on the floor what i've set up for my bedding in system which I hope is going to work because I haven't tested it yet is that's my shoes um, so I've got here uh, basically an oval of track this is just a nice simple um, set track I, I my normal layout doesn't use set track but I thought it's a nice easy way of having a simple loop just to try out um, the loco so even though that's kind of near the carpet I'm hoping it's not going to be too bad and I'm going to place my n-class model down on here as with um, most models with the pony wheels on the front obviously they move independently so you can usually use the coupler on the front just to give it a twist to make sure it ends up in the right place um, and also you know just have a quick look make sure the tenders on properly one of the problems with these new models is they're so fine and the flanges on the wheels are so short um, that sometimes it's almost impossible to see um, whether that's right so obviously that's now on the track. I'm, v I'm hoping, because I haven't used this for a while, that okay. So that's that's quite remarkable. I haven't. Um, I bought this track today from the shop, but it was wrapped up in cellar tape, so it wasn't brand new out of the packet. <laughs> and yet, despite that. Just with a simple DC supply that's running at about 35% that's incredibly smooth um, it's surprisingly quiet and so I'm now just going to leave that running for about half an hour like it says so it's 20 past 5 um, I'm going to come back in a little while and then also um, what I'm then going to do is I'm going to do exactly the same in the opposite direction and then what I'm also going to do is um, do the second model and do exactly the same thing um, and then once those have done half an hour each way I've ordered some um, silver mini lens decoders which I quite like and I'm going to get um, when those have arrived next week sometime I'm then going to uh, fit those into the tender so hopefully you enjoyed that any questions or comments that I might might not be able to help you with then please leave them below otherwise I'll see you in my next unboxing video